My name's David Malone. I have the privilege of working at the United Nations University, which is headquartered in Tokyo. But we're located in about 17 cities around the world on all five major continents. Uh, so our role in Japan is both a scientific one, focusing largely here on the science of sustainability. We have an in-house think tank which works on the principal policy challenges of the UN, or at least a few of them, and overall the management of the university is headquartered here in Tokyo. We're delighted you're joining us online. If you were visiting Tokyo, you'd be able to do so in person uh, because this evening we'll be having a public conversation with Sir Jeremy Greenstock on uh, turbulence in international relations, difficulties in international relations, their causes, and how the UN may or may not uh, be able to help overcome them. Sir Jeremy uh, served as an exceptionally distinguished ambassador and permanent representative of Great Britain to the UN between 1998 and 2003. Since then, he has worked in simultaneously in both the nonprofit and private sector worlds, which rounds out a public sector uh, career. Uh, as a young officer, he trained in Arabic, served in the Middle East. Uh, later on, uh, he turned his attention to the European Union, where he represented his country on the political uh, committee before uh, coming to the United Nations as ambassador. He held a very important post for a while, which was deputy ambassador in Washington. Um, because Britain, uh, particularly at the time perhaps, worked very closely uh, with the United States. So Jeremy, it's a great honor for us to have you here today, and we're looking forward this evening to an engagement with uh, a public here. Um, but I wanted to ask you about this sense that there is not so much violent upheaval in the whole international system, but there is growing difficulty in agreeing on uh, how to go about addressing crisis situations and very serious systemic problems. A crisis situation uh, which is very much in the spotlight at the UN would be Syria, where the Security Council, where you represented Britain for five years, is having great trouble coming together and then staying together on approaches to the Syrian crisis. And I wanted to ask you whether you see that as part of a wider pattern or you think Syria is sui generis and uh, needs to play itself out on its own terms? Well, I think you have some, some general problems with the international institutions at the moment, which we will come to talk about when we've looked at one or two instances. And you have particular problems of very nasty conflicts uh, which the UN is having great difficulty in, in, in managing. I think you and I know, David, that over its 70 years or more, the UN has had a great impact on the lessening of interstate war, particularly between the great powers, which did so much damage to our world in mm. the 20th century. And the UN was created to bring the scourge of war to an end. And to some extent it has, but a lot of the problems that are facing the UN now is coming out of poor governance uh, in or the collapse of individual states and the internal situations that arise out of that where people can't agree if they are fed up with a regime or they have got rid of a leader, they don't know what to do next. They can't come to compromises and they have different views which they fight over. Mm. And the UN doesn't have a natural locus in that situation because member states are supposed to look after their own territory, their own jurisdiction, under international law, of course, and observing uh, 
human rights and humanitarian principles. Uh, but the UN has great difficulty in agreeing amongst its members on what to do about internal situations because some of its larger members uh, don't want to be challenged themselves on their internal situations. So they don't agree to having a precedent set for intervention. And we've seen some unsuccessful interventions uh, in terms of international opinion. Uh, in Iraq is one of the latest examples. To some extent in Libya where we half intervened. The lack of intervention in Yemen or from outside mm. the continent uh, or Syria. Um, some good examples perhaps in East Timor, in Cambodia, in Namibia, in Central America from time to time. But where the major states of the UN, particularly the permanent members, are not in agreement, such is the trend at the moment towards sovereign independence of states in their own territory that uh, nationalistic interests don't agree on the solution to some common problems. And that's the difficulty mm -hmm. that this Secretary General, the next Secretary General, the current Security Council is finding that national prerogatives have become more important than international prerogatives. And there's another general trend which uh, makes me wary about the coming decade, if you like, and that is in long periods of peace, institutions fade in their effectiveness because the compromises under which they were formed are no longer so relevant to 70 years on. And the makeup of states has changed, and the breakdown of states into smaller units, as in the Soviet Union, in Yugoslavia, in Sudan, in Indonesia, East Timor. We've created, since 1990, uh, 22 new states, members of the United Nations. Uh, the individual interests of states become much more important than managing that messy committee in the General Assembly that you and I know so mm. well. And which makes it difficult for the Security Council to be representative of a much greater number. Institutions fade in effectiveness unless they're reformed. And reform is very difficult when there's a charter at the beginning, which if you open up is, is difficult to amend to everybody's satisfaction. Indeed. So you've got some general problems there and particular problems like Syria, where maybe the regime will move on, maybe it won't. If it did move on, who would take its place? Who has taken the place of the Gaddafi regime in Libya? Who, uh, after the Iraq invasion, has stepped up to the plate in Iraq with any real effectiveness? Mm. So you've got some real problems that need attention that are quite different from the founding of the United Nations. Indeed, and after the end of the Cold War, the um UN was able to be helpful in a number of strictly in legal terms internal situations and actually um, the Security Council mandated peacekeeping operations to go into these strictly internal situations because there was a knowledge that these situations don't remain strictly internal for long. They can spill over into neighboring countries, neighboring countries can spill in. And that was the story in the former Yugoslavia, in the Congo, uh, Rwanda, Burundi area with many armies from neighboring countries spilling into the Congo in, I suppose it was, uh, 2004, 2005, 2006. So uh, it's not by taking an arbitrary decision that one won't intervene in the internal affairs of member states that ipso facto one is able to maintain the international peace. Yes. Well, the charter of the UN is very clear States have sovereignty on their own ter territory unless there is a threat to international peace and security on which the Security Council makes some decisions. And then they trump the internal situation. Uh, many member states forget the second part of that <laughs> sentence in Article 2.7. But we've got another problem 
that's arisen from the huge success of the United Nations and its trusteeship council in earlier decades, that colonialism is a, a largely a past concern. We, we've dealt with it. We've produced some very good new independent states. But self-determination is still a very attractive concept for those who don't have their own national territory. There are some quite large uh, ethnic groups, the Kurds, for yes. instance, some groups in Africa that don't have their own state and are subjected to other races within a state. And there the principle of self-determination has a strong moral authority under the United Nations, but the Security Council is there to preserve mm. the current borders. So there's a tension mm. between the evolution of political society and the past arrangements mm. which the UN is there to maintain. And we've never decided within the UN on the limits to self-determination. Do we go on subdividing so that every locality has its own sovereignty, mm. like the sorcerer's apprentice playing with the broomsticks? Mm. Or do we say, no, these borders must stay forever and there must be no flexibility? Well, the UN's answer is that you may change when everybody agrees to change. Yes. But when they don't agree and there's a conflict, the UN has no longer a basis of real principle on which to intervene. Mm. And the UN has no natural in instruments of enforcement with which to compel people to behave to international laws. So that lack of, a, of a, an enforcement mechanism has become a real problem for the United Nations. It was never in the Charter as a top-down instrument mm. for the collective body. You mentioned nationalism just now, and I think we see manifestations of it in places where we hadn't really expected to see outright nationalism. The European Union, which is a project I admire hugely, uh, is not being laid waste, but it's being seriously undermined by nationalism in some places in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe as well. We see also forms of nationalism becoming quite extreme in countries in Asia of whom we did not uh, expect nationalism. We see it happening in the United States in certain forms. In my own country, Canada, we had somewhat milder manifestations of it. And to have nationalism bubbling all over the world, I think, is a threat to the multilateral fabric. If politicians are above all uh, concerned with convincing their publics that uh, the nation state's interests are somehow incompatible with the interests of other states uh, or the interests of the European Union or perhaps even the United Nations, then much of the system of international cooperation we've been building since the late 1940s, I think, uh, will become fairly ineffective. Uh, do you worry about this? I do, because I think the political rhetoric has, has gone in the wrong direction. Uh, and it's understandable that nation states should uh, want to protect their own interests. But some of the problems that they face are shared, and they won't mend those shared problems unless they cooperate. There's, a, the, the, there's quite a strong trend, David, uh, in, in all our minds um, in the reaction against globalization. When people are freer to choose, and I think we are in a freer world, a world of, of freer economic exchange, freer communication mm. and information availability, uh, actually our horizons narrow. If we're freer, we choose our default setting, which is tribal. And it, it's, um, it's a comfortable feeling to be only with people we identify with and not have to work that much harder with people we don't understand so well and aren't so familiar with. And the world will fragment into tribal units mm. 
unless reasons are given to people to work in much larger mm. units than that. And I don't think politicians spend enough time, and I am critical of uh, my own leaders in Britain about this, in persuading people to think of themselves as larger and not as smaller units. Mm. This is why, why I'm, I'm unhappy at the British decision to leave the European Union, which was the most remarkable experiment in continental de togetherness, mm. for good reasons, because the scourge of war hit Europe mm. worse than any other continent in the 20th century. But there is a limit to localizing, to, to feeling tribally comfortable, mm. because the environment, uh, s global security, regional security, uh, human rights, humanitarian uh, good standards, uh, decent trading, all depend on shared interests. And we're neglecting those if we think, uh, in my little province, we'll be much happier if we get rid of our neighboring province. Mm. And I don't like uh, people talking to us in French when we speak English, uh, so, or in Quebec when yes. we're in speaking in French and the rest of the country is speaking rather poor French. Mm. People have gone tribal. Mm. Politicians must go on producing the reasons why we should be better than tribal, mm. wider than tribal, because mm. we've got shared problems and we can't deal with those problems, one of which is competitive economic activity. That's a global problem mm. unless we talk to each other and cooperate. And I thought uh, in the run-up to the referendum in Britain on, on Brexit, the great failure of the then British government was that the, their argument against Brexit was that it would be difficult and inconvenient rather than that Britain was participating in something very worthwhile. Uh, they failed to make a positive argument for their position. I heard the best arguments against Brexit from quite senior ministers who weren't a public face of any great popularity mm -hmm. who'd thought about it and were saying, do you know, the United Kingdom at the moment, pre-Brexit, has the best set of international relationships and memberships of organizations of any advanced industrialized country. We're not regional, uh, we're, we're not local, we're a member of uh, EU, NATO, the international financial institutions. We're a permanent member of the Security Council. We have this marvelous uh, body called the Commonwealth, which brings uh, many other continents together with us to talk about the world, the law, parliamentary democracy, and other things. We are better placed than any other country in our spread of relationships. Mm. And that's worth preserving. It's worth paying something for. Mm because we trade with that, we do business with that, we have partners and allies with that, and we can't afford to be an island. That was a very good argument. It didn't come through no, in the campaign. It didn't. It was, you will lose your job. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we won't be as rich as if we were in the European Union. Uh, yes, we may have to have some foreigners living with us, but um, it would be appalling if we lost our, etc. Yes. That was not, uh, you don't yeah. appeal to people's better nature. And finally, uh, Jeremy, because you sat in the Security Council at a moment of great power division on Iraq in 2003, at the time that seemed unusual, exceptional, and it was at least papered over fairly quickly later in 2003 with the uh, British and American forces provided after the fact a mandate to help the Iraqis set themselves back on their feet. But today we see uh, a nearly permanent uh, irritation of the great powers uh, amongst themselves. The configurations vary a little bit from issue to issue. But the ability to systematically reach out to each other and look for common solutions uh, in the Security Council seems to be losing ground. Yes, the Council still is able to agree on most of the African conflicts, but actually I wonder how long that will continue given how sharp some of the recent disagreements have been. And you haven't mentioned, David, but there, I think in everybody's uh, 
mind, sometimes in the back of their minds, some of the great conflicts since the middle of the last century uh, are still unresolved. Palestine is one of Indeed. them. Indeed. Kashmir is another. Cyprus is another. We fail to mend the long-standing problems which contain uh, some fiercely nationalistic approaches, Indeed. but also some elements of injustice. I think we are losing the institutional habit of compromise and cooperation. Unless we have leaders who persuade their own peoples that this is necessary, your interests are connected with international dialogue. You have a dog in this fight that is your own long-term interest in a stable world, a trading world, an economically growing world, and you're going in the other direction. But the world is going very ad hoc in its policy uh, alliances and prescriptions. For one problem, the, the environment, if you like, you have one set of nations mm. coming together. For global trade in the Pacific or the Atlantic, you have another set of nations. Indeed. On security around the Great Lakes, you have these nations. On Ukraine, you have these nations. On Syria, you have these nations. You know, where is the institutional habit and commitment and operational flywheel turning? Uh, if we lose the UN, which is the great invention mm. in institutional terms of the last uh, generation, two generations, if we lose that, we're in real trouble. So the UN's power to bring people together needs to be renewed, and I want to see political leaders paying more attention to that. Great. Well, thank you so much. For those of you joining us online, uh, we're sorry you won't be able to join us for a longer conversation with a public here at UNU headquarters this evening, but I hope this gave you a flavor of the sorts of issues that we spend some of our time here at the UN University worrying about, thinking about possible solutions to, uh, seeking to isolate evidence that could be helpful for problem solving in the UN. That's something we do. Um, and we'll hope that you may tune in to us again for another brief opportunity to uh, join us in thinking through some of these uh, quite serious, I think, challenges to international relations today. Jeremy, thank you so much for being with us. Great pleasure to be at UNU. Thank you, David.